Father, we come before you and wonder at your amazing power, at your amazing plan of salvation that reached down into this world and called your people Israel, who worked through a mighty arm to save them from the power of the Egyptians. And we thank you, Father, that you have reached down to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the wonder of your salvation has been made known to us in an even greater way in him. And we pray, Father, this morning that as we gather, we might worship him in spirit and truth, that we might acknowledge him as God of our lives, that Jesus is King. And Father, help us to live our lives in the week ahead in recognition of that, that Jesus is seated on the throne. So Father, we pray that everything that's said and done in this place today might be to your honour and glory. We ask this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. If you'd all like to stand, um, we'll be singing uh, in a moment uh, How Great Is Our God, and we'll go straight into that after we've uh, read the Apostles' Creed together. So if, we, if you could stand, we'll read the Apostles' Creed, and then we'll go straight into our first hymn, How Great Thou Art. So we'll recite this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to the August birthday spot. Now boys and girls, I had hoped to get out and about to film my birthday spot, but the weather has not been kind to me this week. So here I am in Cafe One with the August birthday spot. Now, you've only got just over two weeks until you're back at school and what an exciting two weeks we have in store for you. So we have Holiday Bible Club coming up on our jungle adventure. We have the Flourish course for our P7 girls that are moving into first year. And we have uh, Fusion Football coming up as well, all before you go back to school in the next two weeks. But I wonder how you're feeling about school. Perhaps you are super excited to go back into your new class. Maybe you've got a new teacher. Maybe you've got uh, your friends that are in your class and you're really excited about what's coming up. Or maybe you're not too sure about your new teacher. Maybe you don't have your good friends in your class. Maybe you're a little bit worried or nervous about what the year ahead is going to hold. I have a verse for you boys and girls that I would like you to hold on to. Now when I ask you to hold on to it, that means think about it and pray about it and remember this verse. It says, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is an everlasting rock. And that is from Isaiah 26 verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever. God knows what this year ahead will hold for you. Even though sometimes we go through tricky phrase, tricky times, difficult situations. God sees the bigger picture. He knows exactly what's going to happen. So trust in him because he has the best plan in store for you. So trust in that and trust in him forever. God is our everlasting rock. That means he is the same yesterday, the same today, and the same forevermore. The same God that encouraged Moses to speak out to Pharaoh is the same God that loves you. The same God that gave David the strength to defeat Goliath is the same God that loves you and wants the best for you. Trust in him and trust that he has the best plan for your life. And whether you have the best year ahead at school or whether you have days that are sometimes a bit difficult, trust in him, pray to him, tell him about it, ask him to help you, thank him for your good days and ask him to help you in your difficult ones. And I promise that God will absolutely be there for you. Now, celebrating birthdays this month, we have Ruby, Lizzie, Anadu, Michael, and Ruben. I hope you all have a really happy birthday. Let me pray for us now. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are our everlasting rock. I thank you so much that no matter what change happens in our life, no matter what we are going through, good or bad, you are there for us. You know every single hair on our head. You know us from the before we were born and you know our every single day. Father, we thank you so much for the way that you look after us. We thank you so much that you see us when we are having difficult days with our friends at school and you see us when we are having amazing days. And we thank you for that. I ask, dear Father, that you would protect these children in their year ahead. I ask that you would bless them as they move into a new school year. Be with them, protect them. Help them to see your hand of guidance on their life. And dear Father, would you please 
in your timing, help them to see your goodness and to trust your son as their saviour. Father, we thank you for our children celebrating birthdays this month. And we just pray that you would look after them and bless their year ahead. We give you praise for them and thank you for them. We ask these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Now, let's sing our birthday song. And isn't it great that we are now all able to sing together? So let's sing loud um, and celebrate our children's birthdays. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Very happy birthday, boys and girls. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God spoken the world came to be he sent a flood and made everything new he parted the sea and let his people walk through he helped a boy bring a giant right down joshua marched the walls fell to the ground these acts of power Well, <laughs> and just to think that I actually introduced that to the, to the junior church a few years back as well. <laughs> but there we go. Well, if you've got uh, a Bible with you, could you turn to Exodus chapter 12? And we'll be reading from verses 29 to 42. I just want to go back very briefly. Um, at the end of chapter 10, God tells us 
that Pharaoh would not let God's people go. The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. That was plagues where Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, had been shown to be far superior to any of the gods in Egypt. And God threatened a final plague in chapter 11. And in chapter 12, the start of chapter 12, he makes a way of escape for the people of Israel. And chapter 12, we'll start reading at verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I just want to stop there and I want you to think what that, word, that phrase says and what it conveys. It's easy to read those words and just let them pass over us. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up! Go out, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading mold bowls being bound up in their clothes, cloths, cloaks on their shoulders. And the people of Israel had also done as Moses had told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they had thrust, the thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So that same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so big, so strong, so mighty. There's nothing that you cannot do. We thank you that the people of Israel experienced uh, your might as they left the grip of Egypt. We thank you that you showed your mighty hand in the plagues that you brought on the Egyptians. And we thank you that you spared your people through the Passover. Father, we've got so many things to give thanks to you for. 
but we come before you humbly this morning, recognizing our own sinfulness and weakness, the ways that even this week uh, we have come and failed you, the times that we've said, done, and thought things not becoming of those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And those times, Father, when we haven't approached you in prayer, where we haven't read your word, where we haven't spoken of encouragement to others when we could. Father, we are still sinful people in need of your And yet we thank you, as we were singing earlier, that the Lord Jesus Christ has come, that he has paid the price for our sin, and that in him we can find forgiveness and peace and joy everlasting. We pray, Father, we might know your forgiveness here this morning, whether that be for the first time Or not. Father, we thank you that you are a forgiving God. Father, we pray for Holiday Bible Club this coming week. We thank you for those children that have already signed up and we pray that more might be added to their number. We pray for good weather. We pray for the leaders and the helpers that you'll help them to effectively uh, teach your word and to uh, enable the children to have an enjoyable week together. We pray, Father, for the children that they might um, get a greater insight into who you are and what you have done for them. And we pray for the families that they represent for the parents as well, and maybe older and younger siblings. Father, we pray that this week uh, might be used for the extension of your kingdom in this community. We pray, Father, also for those uh, in authority over us. We pray especially for the uh, decisions that will be made in the week ahead in relation to ongoing uh, COVID restrictions. And Father, we pray for your wisdom and your guidance upon them. And we pray, Father, for those that uh, acknowledge you as their king in Parliament, uh, in the Scottish Parliament, and in all areas of authority in our land, Father. Uh, we pray that they might seek uh, your will and seek to live a life which is consistent with your word. Father, we pray for Andy as he comes to speak to us in a few minutes. We pray that um, you might speak clearly to us through him. And we pray that you will, your word might change us this morning. Father, your word is powerful and your word is sharp. We pray that we might put, not put up our defenses against it, um, but that we might be teachable under the authority of your word. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this opportunity to meet together and we pray for those who are not able to meet uh, with us for whatever reason. We pray especially for those who are ill. On a long-term basis, Father, we pray that you will encourage them this morning. We thank you for those who are, uh, have recovered from uh, a bout of COVID this last few weeks. Uh, we thank you for your hand upon them. And Father, we pray for um, all of the children as we were earlier who will be uh, going back to school and maybe starting a new school or certainly a new year. Uh, we pray for them this morning. And we pray for all those who are still on holiday 
We pray that they might have an enjoyable and relaxing time away uh, and bring them back, Father, enthused uh, to get back involved in the work of your church here in Aberdeen. We ask all of these things for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Uh, we'll sing again, but we're going to say the Lord's Prayer uh, before we do. Uh, and that text is quite small, so I, I hope you can read it. But we'll, we'll stand uh, and say the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll sing. Um, we'll sing, O praise the name of the Lord, uh, before Andy comes to preach. So, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Well, a very good morning to you. Really lovely to have you with us, whether that's in person right here in the building or whether you're joining us online this morning. I want to add my welcome to David. It's just great to be together, isn't it, on another Sunday morning. Maybe you're away on holiday. Welcome to you. Maybe you're here on holiday. I know the Herdmans are somewhere in the building. I believe the Millers are back with us as well. A special welcome to you guys. Great to have you back. We've laid on the weather for you, especially this morning. Welcome back to Aberdeen. Do turn with me to Exodus, uh, the passage that David read for us, Exodus chapter 12, as we continue these dramatic uh, portions of Scripture of God's Word. Exodus chapter 12. Now, I wonder if the name Oflag 4C means anything to you. Oflag 4C. Maybe a photograph will help. Some of you are realizing what this place is. I might use its other name, Colditz Castle. <laughs> now the heads are nodding. In World War II, this medieval castle was used by the Germans, as we know, as a prisoner of war camp. It only had two ways in and two ways out, so Colditz was considered to be escape proof. In fact, many of the prisoners who ended up in Colditz were those prisoners who had previously escaped from other camps, and so finally they ended up in Colditz from where they would never, quote, escape. But during the last few years of World War II, numerous attempts were made to escape from Colditz. All ingenious, but only a handful of them were successful. In total, there were only 15 home runs, as the prisoners called them. Home runs, men who escaped from inside the walls of Colditz and made their way all the way back home. Well, this morning, Exodus 12, we are looking at another real-life escape story. But this one involves the entire nation of Israel. They escaped from the most feared and capable military machine of the ancient world. And maybe the most incredible aspect of this escape is that every single one of the Israelites escaped to freedom. It's a remarkable, remarkable, dramatic story. But the hero of this escape story is maybe a little bit surprising to us because having thought of Colditz, we might think that the hero of this escape were the escapees who came up with some ingenious way of escaping from Pharaoh and Egypt. But And through his actions in the Exodus, God is showing them then, and you and me today, who he is, who he really is. And this morning that happens again in Exodus 12, the end of Exodus 12. And we're focusing in this morning on one beautiful aspect of God's character. Just one. But it's worth zooming in on and taking all our time on, really. And it's his faithfulness. And what we're going to see is that his faithfulness is just as true today for you and I as it was back then when these events first took place. And here's the wonderful thing. God wants you and me to know that he is the faithful God. He's chosen to include this aspect of his character in the scriptures for you and me. And he's chosen to put it in here, he's chosen to put this passage in our Bibles for your encouragement and mine. How do we know that? There's a verse coming on the screen from the New Testament, from Romans chapter 15. So important when we open our Bibles at the Old Testament anywhere. Let me read it to you. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That is a remarkable verse. You see what the writer is saying? He's saying everything written in the past, that's the Old Testament scriptures, was written for who? You see that second line? For our instruction. What a beautiful thought that God had you in mind and me when he chose to put Exodus 12 in his Bible. 
And what is Exodus meant to do for us? Look what it says. It's meant to encourage us. It's meant to help us endure the difficult circumstances of our lives. And it's meant to give us hope. When, to be honest, we're feeling hopeless. Isn't that beautiful? And how will Exodus do all these things for us? By revealing who God is, and this morning, especially revealing how faithful he is. So what we're going to do this morning is just walk through this passage, noticing example after example and example of God's faithfulness to us, his people. And then right at the end, we're going to see how the passage put the spotlight on us and the challenge concerning our faithfulness to him. So firstly, faithful God. Finally, this tenth and last plague comes on Egypt. It only takes two verses to describe and record the horror of it. Just two verses, verse 29 and verse 30. And it's so right and appropriate that David paused in his reading. Just two verses, easy just to let it wash over us. Two verses, that's all. I think the writer knows our imaginations can do the rest. But I want us, what I want us to notice, especially in our account, is that everything happens just the way God predicted and said and promised that it would. So, verse 29, how does it, how does it start? At midnight. Do you remember? That's exactly when God said these things would happen, back in Exodus 11, verse 4. Let me read it to you. About midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt. And here we are at midnight. Okay, well, what happened at midnight? Verse 29, continuing. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of a captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. That is just as God warned it would be to Pharaoh in chapter 11. And earlier in Exodus. And the consequences of that, verse 30. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. You can imagine it. Just a sound of wailing across the land, like never been heard before. And again, that detail is just as God said it would be. You've got to notice this. This is so important that everything is working out just as God promised, just as God said. He is a faithful God. And of course, God's faithfulness is a wonderful thing and it's a beautiful thing if you're part of his people. But if you're not, this theme of God's faithfulness is a huge challenge this morning to start taking what God says seriously. You see, God will always do what he says he will do. Now, we might not like that. We might not like some of the things we read that God says he will do and promises to do. But what we're seeing here with Pharaoh, there is no point in arguing with him. When it was God's time for bringing his people out of Egypt, no one on earth could stop him. Not even the most powerful man on earth. God always does what he says, and so, as we've just been singing, if God says, if God promises to us that one day he will send the Lord Jesus back to planet Earth to judge us all, we better believe he will. And if God says and has promised the only way to be rescued on that day of judgment is through the blood of a perfect lamb... That was last week, wasn't it? Early parts of chapter 12, pointing us to the perfect lamb, the Lord Jesus. If God has said that's the only way to be rescued and to be safe on that day, then we'd better be putting our trust in that lamb, in the Lord Jesus. God is a faithful God, and his faithfulness is a challenge to us to take him and his words seriously, if we're not. 
But if we are part of God's people this morning, then his faithfulness gives us huge encouragement and it gives us huge hope. So let's look at a, a load more examples. Verse 31. Finally, finally Pharaoh says, go. In fact, verse 31 in the middle of the night, he summons Moses and Aaron, and he pleads with them. Look at the language. Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel. He pleads with them to leave, which is just what God said would happen back in Exodus 6 and verse 1. Let me read it to you. The Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out. Not just ask them to leave. He's going to send the people of Israel out. And with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God is being faithful. He says, go. Now notice what they do as they leave. Chapter 12 in verse 35 to 36, we're told they take with them all the silver and the gold of their neighbors. It's an astonishing thing, isn't it? Not just being let free, but they're taking all the treasures of Egypt with them. Let me just read you what God had promised back in chapter 3. I mean, would you have believed this if you were one of the slaves back in that day? Chapter 3, verse 22 God says, each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. And here it is, chapter 12, just as God said it would be. Now we need to pause there because some are troubled by that word plunder, as if the Israelites just stole everything they could see and put their hands on. But that is clearly not the case. They did not go in the middle of the night and raid every Egyptian home. Look what chapter 12, verse 36 actually says. Verse 36, the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. And so they plundered the Egyptians. This was just one of the ways that God was looking after and caring for his people even before they set out on this epic journey. I mean, how are they going to have money to buy any supplies as they make their way through the wilderness as caravans come by selling their wares? They've been a slave people. They don't have any resources, any wealth. So what does God do? He provides them with the treasures of Egypt just as he promised he would do. Wonderful. Faithful God. And then verse 37, at last, they are off. The people of Israel finally are heading out for freedom. We're told in the passage a couple of times they're going in a hurry. There's no time for the dough even to rise. They're off at last. But let's stick with our main theme, more evidence of God's faithfulness. Look at the numbers mentioned in verse 37. You can't miss this. How many are leaving on this day? The people of Israel jo journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. And the scholars reckon that's, that's a total of approximately two to three million people. Can you get that kind of crowd in your mind? Not surprising, plenty of people have doubted these numbers and they point to the Hebrew language and they say, actually, that word for thousand there can also be translated as clans or tribes or fighting units. So in fact, there were just 600 clans or fighting units. So probably about 30,000 people in total. Now, what do we do with that when we read something like that? Do we just rip this, this bit of our Bible out? No, we don't. Let me just suggest a couple of ways we'd respond to that argument. Firstly, later on in Exodus, in chapter 38, we're given a total again for the number that left Egypt. And the total is recorded as 603,550. That's pretty precise, isn't it? 
it actually sounds like someone's getting their fingers out and counting them one by, it's a long, long exercise, one by one by one, 603,550. And I'd also want to add, it is very possible that over a 400 year period, a group of 70 people with God's help could grow to these kind of numbers even if the population grew at 2% per year, which does happen. You can do the sums later. But the point for us is not to get lost in the maths. What we're meant to see here is, ah, faithful God. This is God fulfilling the promise he made to Abraham way back in Genesis. That Abraham would become the father of a great nation. The verse is coming on the screen from Genesis 15. Where it says, the Lord brought Abraham outside and said, look towards heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. That was the promise. And here they are, two to three million of them leaving slavery in Egypt. What a faithful God. Final example of his faithfulness. Just notice the time scale. It's not just the numbers that's epic. Look at the time scale. Verse 40 to 41. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Let me read you what God had promised Abraham. Again, back in the same chapter, chapter 15. This is remarkable. He says, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out, notice, with great possessions. Faithful God. Are you seeing it? Now, if you're concerned the numbers don't quite tally, uh, Genesis 15 says 400 years. Exodus 12, we've just read 430 years. Don't panic too much about that. We need to remember that when Israel first settled in Egypt, they were not oppressed, were they? They were shown great favor because of Joseph for a season. And then a new pharaoh comes to power and he starts to enslave and mistreat God's people. Don't worry too much about that 30 years. The main point, God made a promise and God has kept that promise 400 years later after all that suffering. He brings them out. So it's like a drumbeat just running through this passage again and again and again, seven times at least. The author is reminding us the Lord is faithful. And I suggest we need that reminder this morning, again, as his people. All of us will be facing one kind of challenge or another. A number of us are going through very difficult, prolonged periods of suffering and trial. And remember why this passage has been included in the Bible? It's there to encourage you. It's there to help you endure another day, another week. It's there to help us to find some hope to move forward. We have a God who is utterly faithful. We have a God we can trust whatever our situation is today. So if God has promised that he will never leave us or nor forsake us, you can trust him. If God has promised that he's going to use trials of many kinds for our good and for his glory ultimately, you can be absolutely sure he will. And if he has promised to give us the wisdom and guidance we need, when, to be honest, we just do not have the answers, you can stake your life on the fact that he will. He'll give you the wisdom you need. If God's pr promised to provide for us, we will see that provision. It may not be the treasures of Egypt, but he'll provide what you need. He's promised to. He's the faithful one. And if he has promised all those who trust in Jesus a future with no sadness, no tears, no death, no suffering, 
Again, you can stake your life on that promise and start looking forward to it. It's worth noting, isn't it, that God doesn't have to put us in paradise to keep all his promises. Where are they? They are in Egypt. And God fulfills his promises to them in Egypt. We sometimes sing that song, don't we? What a faithful God have I. What a faithful God. What a faithful God have I. Faithful in every way. Be encouraged. Faithful God. But we need to turn to the second part of our title. Faithful people. Just drop down to verse 42. There's something of a summary statement here at the end of our passage. Verse 42, let me read it. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Interesting, this idea of watching over. That word watch over, it can also mean to keep, a night of keeping, or it can mean to fulfill, actually. And so the thought here could very well be that this was a night where God is keeping, fulfilling to the people, keeping all his promises to them. And we've seen that again and again and again. And so the Israelites should in turn be faithful to the God who is keeping and being faithful to them. That seems to be the summary at the end of the passage. And that fits the whole point of the Exodus. Let's not forget what the point is. It was not just, Pharaoh, let my people go. That wasn't the point, was it? That's half of the point. No, it was let my people go that they might worship me or serve me. Your translation might have that. Actually, it's the same word in Hebrew. And that is what Pharaoh is finally willing to say, isn't it? Verse 30, 31, he says, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord. Now, what's interesting is that that word serve or worship used to describe Israel's worship of God is the same word that was used to describe Israel's slavery under the Egyptians. Let me read chapter 2, verse 23 to you. Israel groaned because of their slavery or service. So you get the picture. There's Israel for 400 years serving Pharaoh's harsh regime. And God says, let my son, my people go that they may serve me. So the big question, one of the big questions in all of these chapters is simply this. To whom does Israel really belong? They're serving Pharaoh for so long. And God says, no, come and serve me. And it's quite striking how the big picture of this story moves from the forced construction of buildings for Pharaoh at the start of Exodus, right through to the free, willing construction of a structure, a tabernacle for the Lord, from serving Pharaoh to serving the Lord. And that is what being part of God's people is all about, isn't it? It's about being set free to serve him. Just one verse from the New Testament, Paul, the Apostle Paul makes this so clear. Romans chapter 6, I think it's coming on the screen. Romans 6, he says, thanks be to God you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from your heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, that's the gospel, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Isn't that interesting? We were serving sin. Now Paul says you're serving a new master, a wonderful, gracious, good, kind, merciful master. You're now serving the Lord. But what's very clear from those verses, and it's clear from Exodus, we are not simply set free from slavery to some neutral position here. We're certainly not set free to a life of just indulging ourselves. No, we're set free to serve, to serve righteousness. 
it's recognizing that my life, which has been redeemed through the death of the Lamb, God's Son, it now belongs to my Redeemer, my Rescuer. And that's serving him. It might sound heavy to some of us this morning. Set free from serving sin to now serving God. But what a master we have to serve. And actually that service of him is true freedom. That is true life. Saved to serve. Faithful God. Faithful people. It's a timely challenge. I was reminded last night in a conversation with someone, a leader from the church I grew up in. Um, some of the challenges they're facing as COVID restrictions ease and people just don't want to come back to church. Finally, got all the restrictions uh, removed last Sunday, able to sing with freedom, and only 60 out of 200 people wanted to come back. No physical distancing at all. And so they asked people what was going on, and some just preferred to sit at home watching. A number of us have been there. It's very comfortable, isn't it? Coffee in hand. Others... I'd actually got other plans going on now on Sundays, just developed a different kind of routine. And others said, you know what, Sundays were pretty busy before, involved with this and serving in that. We just don't want Sundays to go back to being a busy, busy day. And then, and then you read Exodus 12 and you read Romans 6 and you're thinking, but surely we're meant to be busy for God, aren't we? We're meant to be serving our wonderful Redeemer, our Rescuer, our Lord, saved to serve. And as we close in our passage, there's, there's just a clue, a hint of a particular challenge, a particular temptation that Israel is going to face in terms of their service to God, in terms of their faithfulness to him. This question, who will they serve? That's the question. And the hint is in these treasures, the treasures of Egypt. That God wonderfully, kindly, freely provides them with gold and silver. Imagine. They're loaded up with the stuff. And now they have a choice to use all this provision, this blessing, these gifts for God's glory, serve him, or abuse them. That's the choice. Now, I hadn't seen this connection before, and I'm very grateful to pastor and writer Kevin DeYoung for it. Um, can you think of the two things that they did with the gold and silver? As the book of Exodus continues, this treasure they got from the Egyptians. Number one, you get to the final chapters. There's lots of chapters on it. They use it to build a tabernacle for God to dwell in. They use it to serve and worship him. But something else, wasn't there, that they used the gold and silver for? They make a golden calf. Isn't that sobering? Because God gives you and he gives me all sorts of gifts, so many things we don't deserve, health, a home, a job, money, abilities, opportunities, relationships, on and on I could go. So many gifts, as if he says, here you are, the people I've rescued, take it, take it and use it to serve me. And sometimes we do with his help. Sometimes we don't. And sometimes we abuse the gifts. We use them to indulge ourselves. We use them for idolatry, just like Israel did. And just zooming in on the silver and gold for a moment. It's not wrong to have silver and gold or money in the bank. God blesses us. He entrusts that with us. But he entrusts it to us to be used to serve him. Is that how we're using it? Or are we using it for the golden calf, the idolatry? That's the question. And of course, this principle applies to the whole of our lives. We have been served, saved to serve. Faithful God, no doubt about it. Can't miss it in the passage. Faithful people. At this point in our studies, I, just, I want to pause and just ask, ask you, what are you making of the story so far? 
And in particular, what are you making of this God? Because page after page after page, he has been making himself known to us. We've seen he's the one true God. He is the holy judge. He's the one who makes distinctions in terms of how he'll treat people on judgment day. He's the one who saves his people. And he is the faithful God. And if you aren't already Is it not time to start taking this God seriously, to start following him? I I end here this morning because of the passage, because it seems that is what some of the Egyptians did when the Israelites left. Did you notice verse 38? Verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them. Isn't that interesting? Egyptians, maybe some from neighboring lands as well, thinking to themselves, wow, that that God, Yahweh, I want to be with him. I want to be with his people because of who Yahweh has shown himself to be, what Yahweh is doing for his people. This is a God worth following. This is a God worth trusting. Many others went with them. What a wise choice, really. In contrast, there's Pharaoh. Don't be like Pharaoh. Did you notice what he said when he let the people go? Verse 32. Take your flocks, your herds, as you've said, and be gone. And bless me also. Bless him? Bless Pharaoh? This man who's ruthlessly oppressed God's people, resisted every warning blow God had sent him, and repeatedly refused to let God's people go. And now he wants a blessing. Or maybe it's a change of heart. Maybe he's genuinely now submitting his heart to Yahweh. But that's what you're thinking. Go to chapter 14 later. Absolutely not. He's as hard as nails as he has been right through. Interesting, Pharaoh could never quite ask for forgiveness, could he? He could ask Moses to pray for him. He could ask Moses to bless him. But forgiveness? It's a whole other matter. And so tragically, chapter 14, what happens? Pharaoh perishes under God's judgment. Don't be like Pharaoh. Humble yourself before this wonderful, gracious, merciful, faithful God. Seek his forgiveness through Jesus. And then see how he will bless you. He's faithful. He will bless you. Let's bow our heads and pray as we close. Just a moment's quiet to reflect, to respond, and maybe even to make that response. To humble yourself before the one true saving God and say, I need you. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. I need to commit my life to living for you. Father God, we praise you that you are the faithful one. You are the one who can be trusted at all times. You are the one who, when you make a promise, you always fulfill it. And we would just pray for the help of your spirit that we might learn to trust you more today, tomorrow, in the days to come even when the circumstances look like and might feel like you have forgotten your promises. You never do. Help us to walk by faith, not by sight, and to trust you this week. 
And if we've never, never taken that step of surrendering our life to you, of putting our trust in you, would you please show us the wisdom of doing that this morning? Would you show us the urgent need for us to do it? Open our eyes, help us to see, help us to think clearly, we pray. So we commit ourselves to you at the start of this new week, praising you that you are the faithful one. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing our final song for this morning. It's a beautiful song. All the focus on God, what a wonderful, glorious God we have. Behold our God. If you're joining us online this morning, God bless you through the week to come.